Good evening, good evening to you. Good evening, good evening to you. Good evening, good evening. Won't you share with a friend or two? Good evening, good evening to you. Ooh, good evening, good evening to you. Oh, 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 good evening, good evening to you. Good evening, good evening to you. Good evening, good evening. Won't you share with a friend or two? Good evening, good evening to you. You, good evening. Good evening, good evening to you. Good evening, good evening, good evening, and welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of Daring Dialogues. I am your host tonight, Shantae Charles. I hope that you've been having a great and wonderful day, a great and productive day, a day of life and health and strength and peace. Tonight, we are continuing our Women's History series. And we are back in the two books we have been reading for the last week or so. Good Night Stories for Rebel Girls, edited by Lily Workne, forward by Kashawn Thompson. And She Raised Her Voice, 50 Black Women Who Sang Their Way Into Music History, written by Jordana Elizabeth, illustrated by Brianna Dingo. So we are going to start tonight with the good night stories for rebel girls and we have three very powerful women from history both i believe all of our icons tonight are one is from the present and two are from the past in this book and the first person we're taking a look at tonight is audrey lord the poet she says When we speak, we are afraid our words will not be heard or welcomed. But when we are silent, we are still afraid. So it is better to speak. And here's the illustration from the one of the artists in this book. Audrey Lord was born February 18, 1934, and she lived and passed November 17, 1992 born right here in the United States of America. Once there was a girl who didn't speak until she was four years old. Audrey listened carefully though, and what finally came out of her mouth was beautiful. Audrey learned early that words have power. In high school, she memorized famous lines from great poets, but eventually borrowed words were not enough. The budding poet and her school friends, all of them daughters of immigrants, formed a group called The Branded. Audrey's parents were from Barbados in Grenada. She worked many jobs while she studied to become a librarian, and in 1968, she published her first collection of poems called The First Cities. Audrey beamed with joy as she read from the pages of her crisp new book, full of enchanting words, her words. She put out a new poetry collection every two years until 1978, when her masterpiece, The Black Unicorn, hit bookstores. That same year, she was diagnosed with breast cancer and began the fight of her life. She wrote about her illness and pain. She hoped that others struggling with cancer wouldn't feel so alone. Audrey did not just write pretty words. Her words called for social change, acceptance, and celebration of difference. Together with a group of writer friends, she started a publishing company called Kitchen Table Women of Color Press to raise up women's voices. She described herself as black, feminist, mother, warrior, poet. She will always be remembered for her fearless words. 
Now on to one of my favorite artists and sculptors, sculptresses, and that is Augusta Savage. Augusta Savage was born February 1892, and she passed March 26, 1962, born in the United States of America. One of her quotes, how am I to compete with other American artists if I'm not given the same opportunity? Don't we know that? Once in Florida, there was a girl named Augusta who had 13 siblings, but not a single toy. She loved digging her hands into the red clay in her backyard. Instead of making mud pies, she'd mold the clay into ducks and other animals. At 29 years old with little money, but lots of encouragement, Augusta moved to Harlem, a black neighborhood in New York City. There she studied at the prestigious art school tuition free. Many artists at that time portrayed black people with exaggerated features. Augusta and other Harlem Renaissance artists rejected those offensive depictions. Instead, she created sculptures that showed black people in a realistic way, the way they really were. Augusta earned a scholarship to an art school in Paris but when the selection committee found out she was black, they withdrew the offer. Augusta spoke out about it. She said she was standing up not only for herself, but for future students of color. Six years later, Augusta made it to Paris with another grant. She exhibited her art and won awards. When she returned to the US, she transformed her studio into a free school where she mentored future master artists. For the 1939 World's Fair, she made a remarkable 16 foot sculpture nicknamed the harp. This harp was based on John Weldon Johnson's poem, Lift Every Voice and Sing, which later became a song. In it, 12 singing black children stand on the hand of God as if they are the strings of a harp. Like many of her works, the harp did not survive because she did not have the money to cast it in bronze. She was hoping for a sponsor during the 1939 World's Fair. You can actually uh, look up Augusta Savage 1939 World Fair on YouTube, and it will show you just a very short video. I think it's about a minute long of how monumental this um, sculpture would have been had it um, been cast in bronze. But because she didn't have anywhere to put it, they destroyed it after the World's Fair. Since then, of course, people have made smaller copies and replicas of it. The daring beauty of her existing sculptures, however, remains an inspiration to all. And our last young woman from the Good Night Stories for Rebel Girls book is Aya Sissoko. And this is a rendering of her. Good evening. Her quote, there is nothing more important than Don Bay. Born November 23rd, 1978 in France. She's a November baby, so I already know she's going to be awesome. <laughs> Pardon my um, bias. <laughs> Once there was a girl named Aya who didn't give up when life knocked her down. Her parents immigrated from Mali in West Africa to France. They all lived together in a one room apartment. They were poor, but with her siblings, toys and school, Aya was happy. When she was eight, Aya suffered a terrible tragedy. She lost her father and her sister. Less than a year later, her brother fell ill and also passed away. Aya found strength by playing sports. She practiced archery, judo and swimming but she loved boxing most of all. In the ring, she released the pain she wasn't able to express with words. It saved me, she said. Boxing allowed me to stand up. Though her mother wasn't happy about her interest in a boy sport, Aya started intense training, running, doing push-ups, practicing punches. At 12, she won her first French championship. Later, she became a French, a European, and then a three-time world champion, but she still earned less than men. She worked nine hours a day as an accountant while training six days a week. In 2008, tragedy struck again. Aya was seriously hurt during a boxing match and ended up paralyzed on one side of her body. 
but she was resilient. She learned to walk and use her arm again. She wrote about her life in a book called Don Bay, which means dignity, and encouraged readers to keep going even during rough times. In the book, Aya wrote a lot about her mother. She realized that her mother's courage and self-respect had always been her inspiration. Aya Sissoko. All right. So we are now going to move on to the songstresses. Let us see. Let us see. Um, on tomorrow, we're going to be talking about a woman from the Miami Fort Lauderdale area. And uh, I'm excited to share about her. She's in Good Night's Stories for Rebel Girls. All right. Moving on to music, music history. We've got four women tonight. Four women. The first is Roberta Flack. This is another name people need to start saying again and putting some respect on. Roberta Flack. Roberta Flack is mainly out of the folk soul genre, born February 10th, 1937, and she is still living. Shout out Roberta Flack. I might just tag her in this video tonight. She is a master of folk soul music. She says, I tell my own story in each song as honestly as I can in the hope that each person can hear it and feel their own story within those feelings. For much of Roberta Flack's life, classical music was the way she expressed herself. Her gift for playing the piano showed promise as soon as she began to study the instrument at age nine. Growing up, Roberta gave much of her attention to music, and when she turned 15, she had gotten so good at playing piano that she received a full scholarship to Howard University, a historically black college in DC. In fact, Roberta is known to be one of the youngest people ever to enroll at the university. She studied hard and graduated four years later. During that time, Roberta had no idea that she would eventually become an influential musician. After college, she taught music to children and gave private lessons in her home so she could afford to take care of herself. It was her vocal teacher, Frederick Wilkerson, who first heard Roberta playing pop and R.B. music, who encouraged her to play different kinds of music outside of the classical genre. Roberta started playing nightclubs after teaching her classes and was soon offered a job playing at a D.C. restaurant called Mr. Henry's. From there, her name and music began to spread. Her fan base grew to include famous movie stars and filmmakers who heard about her beautiful style of music. Roberta's first recorded album, First Take, was released in 1969. The album didn't sell very well until movie star and film director Clint Eastwood chose one of the songs, The First Time I Ever Saw Your Face, to be featured in his 1971 movie, Play Misty for Me. This lucky exposure caused the song and her first album to sell more than one million records, and it also won Roberta a Grammy for record of the year. The following year, she released the song she is most known for, Killing Me Softly, with his song. This song was another huge hit and won her another Record of the Year Grammy. Roberta is the only artist to ever win Record of the Year two years in a row. Roberta's music is elegant. Her soft flowing voice coated over her minimal piano playing makes her sound very different from the pop music of the late 60s and the disco and funk music of the 1970s. She sang about the quietness and sensitivity of love, which made her fans feel deeply connected to her music. It is calming and a new kind of genre was created around her sweet and powerful musical style called Quiet Storm. Roberta's third number one song came in 1974 and was titled Feel Like Making Love. Roberta also performed duets with singer Donny Hathaway in the 70s and Peebo Bryson in the 80s. And she had a big dance hit with the reggae artist Maxie Priest in 1991. Her songs with other artists are just as beautiful and romantic as her solo songs, 
giving her ways to express her music to different listeners. Roberta is a lifelong musician who made sweet and touching songs while the world around her was whizzing by. She is living proof that it can pay to be to simplify and to simply be yourself while following your dream. Roberta Black. Now, we have consistently heard about this young lady, but I do want to reiterate her because she's the queen of soul. <laughs> and all of these books seem to pick up on different facets or different aspects of each one of these people because some of them are featured in more than one book. But I like this one because it's going to focus mainly and primarily on her musical career. And that is none other than Aretha Franklin, Queen of Soul, recently departed from us. It feels like yesterday, but it was in 2018. So let's snap to it. Aretha Franklin, born March 25th, 1942. And transition August 16th, 2018. Her genres were gospel and soul. She said, it really is an honor if I can be inspirational to a younger singer or person. It means I've done my job. Aretha Franklin, the incredible queen of soul, is one of the most beloved singers of all time. She has sung more than 100 hit songs and many of those rose to number one in every decade since the 1960s, including Never Gonna Break My Faith, a gospel song that was released in 2020, two years after she passed away. Aretha was born in Memphis, Tennessee, to piano player and vocalist Barbara Siggers Franklin and minister C.L. Franklin, who moved her family to Detroit when Aretha was young so he could become the lead pastor of New Bethel Baptist Church. The church is where young Aretha received much of her musical training. She sang in the church choir and it quickly became clear to her father. Her mother tragically passed away when Aretha was only nine and the members of her church that she was a star in the making. She was encouraged to become a soloist and she learned to sing leads and stand out from the crowd. To help after the loss of her mother, women from the church came to watch over Aretha and her siblings. One of those women was the famous gospel singer Mahalia Jackson, also known as the Queen of Gospel. By the time Aretha was 12, she was traveling as a singer with her father, who grew to be a famous, well-paid preacher. Aretha would spend summers um, with successful gospel singers like Mavis Staples' family, and then she caught the attention of powerful pop musicians like Sam Cooke and Dinah Washington. Aretha recorded albums throughout her teenage years and released her first non-gospel album, Aretha, with Ray Bryant Combo, when she was only 19 years old. In her early professional recording career, she sang in different musical styles like jazz, blues, doo-wop, and R&B. But her sultry voice would eventually earn her the title Queen of Soul. Aretha is most known for her songs, You Make Me Feel Like a Natural Woman, Chain of Fools, I Say a Little Prayer. But her most famous song is one written by soul singer Otis Redding called Respect. The way Aretha sang it from a hardworking woman's point of view made it an important song for the women's rights and civil rights movements of 1960s. In fact, Aretha Franklin knew Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. very well because her father and King's influence made her a strong activist. Aretha's music has touched generations of people and musical artists like Alicia Keys, Mariah Carey, Mary J. Blige, and Lauryn Hill. Her songs play on even today after her passing and her beautiful spirit will shine for decades to come. Now, another uh, iconic woman we have not talked about here on this platform before, but we're going to talk about her tonight. And that is Billie Holiday. And I actually really like this particular rendering of her. I think they did a great job. Billie Holiday's genre is jazz. 
and she is known as the Queen of Song. Born April 7, 1915, and passed transition July 17, 1959. She said, People don't understand the kind of fight it takes to record what you want to record the way you want to record it. Now that is a whole preached word. Having recorded one EP and two full-length albums, I entirely agree (laughs) with that statement. Nevertheless, it can be done if you fund your own project. It was a long, hard road for Billie Holiday to become one of the world's most important and influential singers. Eleonora Fagan, Billie's birth name, was abused as a young person, and no one truly knows who her birth father was. She moved from Baltimore to Harlem when she was a teenager. In Harlem, she began performing in nightclubs and soon received a record deal in 1935 when she was only 20 years old. Billie's keen ability to improvise music, which meant she could sing along to music and make up her own melodies and lyrics, helped her to stand out as a young vocalist. One of her earliest recordings, What a Little Moonlight Can Do, brought her some success. And this marked the moment when Billie was on her way to becoming the woman she was destined to be. She traveled with one of the best big band groups of the time, which was led by Count Basie. He had a say in how the band played, making sure the music was just right for her beautiful, emotional singing. After leaving Count Basie's group because of disagreements with the band, Billy began singing with Artie Shaw's band, an all-white big band, making her the first Black woman to sing with a major all-white band. Billy later came upon the song that would make her a legend, Strange Fruit. The song was about the lynching of black people and Billy was hesitant to sing it for a long time, being afraid that people would lash out at her. But when she finally performed this transformative song, she captivated her audience, wooing them with her sad voice and the violent tone to her lyrics. The song made her a star. It did bring a lot of troubling attention due to racism, but once she decided to sing the song, she was determined to never let anyone keep her from performing it whenever she could. Billy went on to have hit songs like God Bless the Child, Lover Man, and many others. She sold millions of records in her lifetime, but sadly, Billy couldn't escape her complicated life. She was known to have had a drug addiction and eventually found herself in court, a trial she called the United States of America versus Billy Holiday. She went to jail for drug possession, but was soon released. Billy fortunately was able to continue her successful singing career until she passed away. Her life was cut all too short due to her inability to quit drinking and her inability to stop her drug addiction. Billy was a wounded soul who rose to stardom. After her death, her popularity continued to grow and Billy's spirit lives on in the hearts and minds of the music-loving masses. She is one of the most powerful and impactful singers in all of jazz history. And you really, if you want to see, there are a couple of um, films on Billie Holiday. I think the latest one was played by, what's the girl's name? Andra Day, uh, played in the latest remaking of a film about Billie Holiday. Our last songstress for tonight is none other than Lena Horne. Her genre is jazz, and she is known as an icon for the ages. And here is their fantastic rendering. Here we go. She said, I made a promise to myself to be kinder to other people. For more than 70 years, Lena Horne lived her life as a singer, actress, and civil rights activist. She released more than 50 music albums, and as a movie star, she was featured in dozens of films, even while segregation was still legal in the United States. Lena was born in Brooklyn, New York. She moved around a lot as a child and was mainly raised by her grandparents because her mother was a working actress who often traveled and her father moved away when she was a little girl. 
When she wasn't with her grandparents, Lena split her time between her parents' houses, one in New York and the other in Pittsburgh. In Pittsburgh, Lena received early training as a jazz singer by working with talented musicians like jazz pianist and composer Billy Strayhorn. While in her early 20s, Lena began working as a dancer in the chorus of a very popular black nightclub in Harlem, the Cotton Club. There, she met jazz singer Adelaide Hall, who taught Lena the ins and outs of being an entertainer. Lena learned quickly and became a rising star in New York City. In 1935, she was featured in her first of many films, Cab Calloway's Jitterbug Party. Although things were going well for her, Lena knew there was a bigger world outside of New York. So in the 1940s, she moved to Los Angeles to perform and act in movies. She is best known for singing her signature song, Stormy Weather, in the film, Stormy Weather, in 1943. Lena struggled in Hollywood because she was only allowed to sing in films. She couldn't have actual leading roles because she was Black. Lena was forced to sing songs that could easily be cut out of the movie she appeared in because many movie theaters in the United States refused to show movies with Black actors due to segregation and racism. But Lena persevered and worked successfully through both World War II and the Civil Rights Movement. During the war, she entertained the troops and would get angry because the Black soldiers had to sit in the back while she performed. Lena would walk off stage and go to the back of the room and perform as closely as she could to the black soldiers to show them that they mattered to her. During the civil rights era, Lena spoke at the historic March on Washington in 1963 and worked with Eleanor Roosevelt to enact laws to stop black people from being lynched. In the 1960s and 70s, Lena appeared on many different TV shows, including mm -hmm. The Muppet Show and Sesame Street. In the 80s and through the 90s, she continued to act, work, and perform, even as she entered her older age. Lena Horne was known for her beauty, her grace, and her bravery as an activist who fought for equality in the face of racism and unfairness. She is an irreplaceable icon in Black music, and a deeply loved figure of the 20th century, Lena Horn. Much respect and props to her for letting Black men know that they matter. Tomorrow, we're going to be looking at Janet Jackson, Mahalia Jackson, and Etta James. All right, this was a pretty awesome roundup of women and figures tonight. A lot of them, if you notice, had several things in common, um, but I want to yield the floor. So if you would like to come on and discuss any of the women and anything that stood out to you about them, or if you felt inspired by parts of their story, feel free to click on the camera and I will bring you in and we can have a discussion and chat it up. Let's see if we have any takers tonight. If you are listening by anchor.fm, I want to thank you for your time and attention. Thank you for tuning in. Don't forget on Friday, we will have with us author Kenyatta Manley, who will be talking about two of her works. Take care, and until next time, be light. All right. Doesn't look like I have anyone coming in tonight, so I am going to end here. Thank you all for your time and attention. This has been another episode of Daring Dialogues, and I've been your host tonight, Shante Charles. Remember, light is the most daring opposition to darkness, so continue to be light. Take care. And God bless.